Gwen Buck, welcome to the Trips and Global on Wheels podcast hour. Thanks so much for having me. It's really great to be here. Of course. So um, I'm Ming, as you know, and uh, I'm co-hosting this with Jean Mishner. Jean, do you want to introduce yourself to Gwen? Yeah, hi Gwen. Uh, this is Jean. I'm actually dialing in from Melbourne tonight, which uh, I'm not sure what time it is in uh, London. Um, it's two in the afternoon in London. What about Melbourne? Uh, it's about 11 o'clock at night. So. Wow, we're, we're, tr- we're truly global. <laughs> yeah, well, really looking forward to um, meeting with you today. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Yeah, it's, it's 9 a.m. here in Washington, D.C. So Gwen Buck joined Green Alliance as a policy advisor in November of 2018 to work on the Climate, climate Leadership Program for a member of parliament, which engages member of parliament in climate change. She also works for Greener UK, the coalition for ensuring environmental standards are maintained during Brexit and in future free trade agreements. Gwen previously worked for the Green Party, both for the leadership team in London and for a member of the European Parliament. Um, She holds a Bachelor's of Science in Environmental Science from Plymouth University. Welcome, Gwen. Thank you. So I see that you are part of the Health and Safety Officer of the Vegan and Vegetarian Society (laughs) at at Plymouth University. Can you give us a compelling example um, case for why being vegan or vegetarian is good for the long-term sustainability of our planet? And perhaps Jean can help you out if you struggle. (laughs) Sure. Um, yeah, I guess for me, um, it's all about living, um, living in a lifestyle that you really want to see in the world um, and actually thinking about it holistically as well. So um, I really feel like often people put um, veganism into two different camps. It's kind of like the either you do it for the environment or you do it because you don't want cruelty to animals. Um, but actually, for me, it's much more holistic and it's like, you know, I don't want an animal to suffer. I also don't want nature to suffer. I don't want the climate to suffer. I don't want people around the world suffering. Um, so it really is, is kind of a bit of a, of a way that I kind of feel like I'm able to take a bit of empowerment myself um, in the way I live my life. Um, I also appreciate though that, you know, a huge amount of pollution done is, is due to a very small minority of, of, huge polluting corporations um, and some people might not be able to um, change their lifestyle and might not want to do that Um, so that's why I also believe that um, as important as it is to do your own thing uh, we really need to work for systemic change as well. Did you make that uh, diet change uh, because of your involvement with that group Uh, or did you find it because you're already um, you know uh, you've already made that change? Um, it was actually because I'd already made that change. So um, it was actually interesting. I, I, my, my mum was a vegetarian, so I, I became vegetarian when I was a kid because it was really easy to do. And we kept chickens for eggs and I kind of thought, um, you know, I wouldn't want to eat them because they were pets. So I, I wouldn't eat another chicken. Um, and then, yeah, so I've been a vegetarian for a really long time um, and I guess been vegan for about five or six years now um but yeah when I went to university I was studying environmental science I actually found that a lot of um my fellow students weren't vegetarian or vegan which really surprised me actually because I kind of thought you know going to study an environmental degree that I would be full you know I'd be surrounded by vegetarian hippies but it really wasn't the case um so I kind of wanted to be able to share a little bit about um you know how you can you can do that to reduce your environmental impact on the earth as well. Uh, that's very interesting. Uh, do you think that I, I imagine it's been some years since you were um, in that group? But do you think that over time, people who you knew back then may well will probably have made that connection and made that change by now? Yeah, and actually a lot of them have now. Um, So when I follow my old uh, classmates on social media, I can see that they're all posting their hashtag vegan food now. Um, And I also think that, um, you know, the, the... the, the, the university students now are so um, politically active and so amazing. I mean, obviously we've seen like the school strikes and that kind of thing. And there's such a, 
um, amazing political um, and environmental youth coming up now that I imagine that course would look pretty different, even though it was maybe only, you know, less than 10 years ago now. It'd be very interesting to see what the mm. steps would be. Uh, actually, we, we were reading up about Green Alliance, um, mm. but we thought we'd let you maybe talk about it first, just in sure. basic um, for our audience. Yeah, so Green Alliance is an environmental think tank. Um, so we work mainly influencing politics um, and we focus on UK politics. Um, and we are, we are coming up with new policy ideas um, and it's all about protecting the environment. Um, so it's all about either tackling climate change or trying to create um, a circular economy so we don't have to use as much resources, reducing plastic waste, um, and also um, the links between um, land use and agriculture um, and the environment. Um, so we do a lot of um, policy reports working on those and then we work with um, politicians to try and get those implemented as well. Um, we also do a lot of um, convening within the environment sector in the UK. So um, we gather around all, all the other sort of environmental charities based in the UK um, to create sort of outputs together. So um, obviously over here, a big thing has been Brexit, which I know you mentioned in my bio, um, and a huge proportion of environmental protections in the UK were actually coming from European law. Um, so now we have, well, we have Brexited. Um, now that's happened, we as an environmental movement wanted to make sure that all those environmental protections weren't lost during Brexit. Um, we're still fighting for that. Um, there are some areas where, um, which are really concerning, but um, also areas where we've been able to push things forward um, in a way that we haven't before. So yeah, so that, that's the kind of thing that we do as an organization. It's great to see how your, you know, your personal and professional life all line up. What is the key to getting government, getting government officials to take climate change issues uh, more seriously? Um, and, and you did mention the differences in that it, it, it is less partisan. Sure. Well, I think actually, yeah, what I mentioned before about um, the benefits to the economy is something that a politician just can't ignore. Um, and those are are really the facts and I think it's 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 amazing because now we see so many examples from around the world of of where um, growing the economy and tackling climate change can really go hand in hand um, there's a lot of discussion in the UK at the moment about um, the coronavirus response um, and how we kickstart the economy after the kind of economic impact of coronavirus um, and I think what we're really hoping and what we're expecting might take place is that our government will um, announce measures to kickstart the economy which are also go some way to help achieving our net zero goal by 2050 so the UK has legislation um, which says we have to get to net zero carbon emissions by 2050 um, and so in order to do that, there is so much that needs to be done in terms of um, structural shifts around our economy. But um, actually, can we use this, um, you know, this thing that has been so awful and terrible in coronavirus, but can we, um, can we use that to actually drive that economic boost into something positive for, um, for the climate change as well? That's great. Thank you. G? Yeah, um, I was just thinking the um, in in terms of a practical level, like uh, having written skills would be great to write in um, mm. in the channel. But um, th there's a certain um, I guess reluctance by people who it might be like their first time writing in, or it might be the first time they really had to even uh, try and explain things like climate change in their own words. Mm -hmm. um, would, you, would you say that there are uh, skills or courses or uh, ways that people can, uh, you know, just, just quickly develop in order to deliver the message more impactfully? Yeah, I mean, there are quite a lot of resources online. Um, so there are quite a few um, charities um, who are focused around um, how to, um, 
you know, engage on climate change. Um, we have an amazing one in the UK called Hope for the Future. Uh, they're a really tiny charity, but they create loads of resources. Um, and it's all about how as a community, in your community, you can engage your local politician on climate change. And they've got so many resources about how to uh, engage them. But I also think that like, um, politicians are often seen as inaccessible um, and it's actually not the case and they are there to represent you, that's their job. So um, I think just remembering that, you know, you don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to, you know, it's not like you're gonna be debating with them. You don't have to worry really. Um, even just, you know, saying a little, a few things that you're concerned about, it really is enough, yeah. Generally speaking, what is, so summarize UK's uh, politicians' view on climate change and then, and then the, the, the consensus for a solution plan. Mm, sure. Um, so I think the UK is in quite an interesting position because um, we, um, we had this thing called the Climate Change Act um, back in um, 2008, I think it was, um, and that was brought in by a Labour government, but it was a real joint effort between um, Parliament and um, different, you know, different environmental groups. Um, and what that act did was it meant that we had to reduce net zero emissions by 80% by 2050. And that's because that was aligning with the science at that time, um, back in 2008. Um, but then also what it meant is that in order to do that, you have to sort of like incrementally reduce your carbon emissions every year. So you have to do a progress report and you have to show how you're doing that. So we had that put down in law um, and that was a real first globally, I think. Um, it was a bit of a, a cornerstone. And so I think what's quite interesting is that uh, we have that piece of legislation um, and then also at a similar time we or the government at the time um, commissioned an independent review into the economic impact of climate change and that's called a Stern review um, and what um, Nicholas Stern did was that he reviewed um, with a team of economists all the impacts of climate change and how it would impact the economy um, and it basically showed that the economy is just going to be trashed if we have runaway climate change. Like the two are really, really interlinked um, and you really need to, to, you know, tackle climate change as a priority for your country to prosper, basically, economically. Um, and so I think what that did was it was able to um, bring politicians along who had maybe previously thought of climate change as just oh you know some hippie stuff like it's like oh actually this is like a serious issue that's impacting the economy um, so I think that's quite an interesting story um, and what we have now is we've got a conservative government um, so a right-wing government um, but actually they brought in legislation to get to net zero by 2050 um, and I would say they've got some way to go to achieving that. Um, and we haven't necessarily seen the policies put in place that we need to, to get there. Um, however, it is a really good um, ambition. And um, we also in the UK are gonna be hosting um, the next United Nations Climate Change Conference. Um, that's gonna be next year. It was supposed to be this year, but it was postponed because of coronavirus. Um, but that's going to be hosted in Glasgow in Scotland next year. So that's called COP26. And at COP26, all countries from all around the world are going to be coming together and they're going to be saying, uh, this is what I'm planning to do to tackle carbon emissions in my country. Um, and so it's a really um, amazing opportunity for the UK to actually put itself on the global stage. Um, and I think we're actually at a really interesting point in our history because obviously we've come out of the European Union and our government is thinking about ways that it can be seen as a kind of positive force for good in the world and like finding itself on the new global stage. Um, so I think actually by giving a um, indication that we want to be a global leader in tackling climate change is like a really nice, um, it's like a positive story that can be told. Um, so yeah so i think there's kind of like a few different things going on there but i do feel even though um we are 
you know, even though there are some way to go to tackling uh, climate change in terms of the actual policies that the government is putting in place, I think the ambition is there and that's really special. So I think, um, yeah, there's a real effort in the UK to make sure that it doesn't become more of a polarised issue. Uh, we're obviously concerned, um, you know, the more extreme right wing um, are still, you know, climate deniers, you know, there are still climate deniers in the UK, but um, I think there's a real effort to ensure that they, um, you know, that their arguments don't take hold. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jean, if you don't mind, I'm actually jumping on to the next section, so mm -hmm. I'll kick it off um, and then you can continue from there. So I, I want to move on to this intersectionality of climate change and disability. Mm. And I know you don't have a lot of specific background in the area. So I'll just ask you some general questions and your thoughts sure. surrounding it. Mm. Um, so how can we include more diverse voices in the climate change fight, you know, such as increasing the participation of people with disabilities? Yeah, it's a, it's a really great question and one that, um, again, has answers on lots of different levels because um there are obviously the climate movement is huge right um and it, it spans um local community groups to people working in um huge environmental charities like greenpeace and friends of the earth and that kind of stuff so i think there's so many levels where there there kind of either needs to be more or there already is a lot of representation um so where I am in my think tank, there is a real lack of diversity and a lack of representation. Um, but whereas like the climate movement as a whole in the UK um, is much more diverse. So I think there is, you know, there's, there's that kind of thing that is holding back so many um, other organisations and, you know, corporates and that kind of thing where you know, you really do need um, to be able to embed diversity within paid organizations as well to make sure that those people who either have div uh, disabilities or people of color, people um, and LGBT people are really are able to kind of feel, um, you know, in integral into part of the kind of like that kind of paid area of the climate movement as well, um, so that their voices and um, the policies that might impact them more are integrated within um, you know the policies that we're pushing for um, and I know it's something that um, environmental organizations in the UK are, are, are it's a live topic right now and one that absolutely we need to do better um, and it just can't it just can't, you know it can't stay as it is at the moment um, I think that you know, it really does need to change. Um, and there is a lot of will there. So um, it's really sort of like holding, you know, we really need to hold inv the environment movement to account over it as well. Um, and I think there's also things like, um, you know, I've, I've worked in sort of events um you know for like for like climate change related events um and it's you know accessibility in those spaces and stuff it just really needs to become a core part of the mission as well because you know what's the point in solving climate change if you know not everyone is welcome and not everyone is part of the solution so i think that yeah it just really needs to become part of the core mission of of the environment movement mm -hmm. and it's you know some of the yeah. most marginalized groups are the most impacted, as you were saying Absolutely, earlier, yeah. mm. right? People in those, mm. in the islands, um, yeah. people with disabilities, uh, with it being much harder to evacuate, some people with certain disabilities mm. cannot adjust to heat with the, you know, yeah. heat waves all across the country, uh, wildfires, whatnot. So, so even though they're not, they're not included, but they the, sometimes are the most impacted. And so perhaps they'll have more of the practical feedback. Um, yeah, absolutely. If, mm. if included. Well, so when it comes to things like uh, disability and inclusion, um, mm. I would presume that uh, someone in your position who has had that academic and professional experience uh, in matters of things like climate change um, have had maybe some formal element of that training which focused on disabilities and, and how to manage that in society and with public policy. But that's just an assumption. Uh, could you maybe draw in any specific examples of, you know, anything in like your training or education or in your professional development, which specifically called that out and made um, 
made you have to think about it uh, at some length? Uh, you know what? I'm going to be totally honest and say that I've never had any training on this. Um, and it's just not clearly seen as a, as a priority at the moment. It wasn't in my degree. Um, and I've been at the organization that I'm at now for about two years. Um, and it's only through actually grassroots activism that I've been doing training in this stuff. Um, so it's actually been sort of like the grassroots movements who've understood that there are clear um, intersectionality links within the climate movement, um, as Ming, you just mentioned in terms of um, the most vulnerable um, to climate change, um, you know, that they need to be part of the solution as well. Um, and so I think that is something that the grassroots movements in the UK um, are understanding more um, and have pushed. And so it's, so, it's, so it's through sort of like more grassroots movements that I've been um, interested in these issues. And that's made me bring it up at my workplace. Um, so actually, literally just a meeting before jumping on this interview we were having a discussion about this um at work so like how can we formalize um things like that training but i think there's also like um training is important but it's like actually how do you embed um this actually within the kind of community at work um so like training is one thing but actually it's about like how you know, it's also about how you you are as a as a work community and how you're looking out for each other and how you're ensuring that your you know your privilege isn't isn't negatively impacting on other people um, and actually be you know providing a positive space for for other people. Yeah, and uh, so next question is a bit is related. Have you asked? Uh, it sounds like you're very new at starting this route, especially gaining exposure from the grassroots level recently. Have you asked people with disabilities how climate change affects them specifically? If not, would you consider doing it and passing that message on to me, MPs, in a systematic way? Um, I haven't, but um, but yeah, I totally would, and I think that that's a really a really great idea. Yeah, um, yeah. Thank thank you. Uh, what are some effective ways that uh, we can make people more aware of uh, the needs and desires of uh, people in the community with a disability, uh, especially in the intersection with climate change? Mm, yeah, so um, when I was working at the Green Party um, uh, previously, I worked quite a lot with the disability group um, there. So it was like a the kind of like grassroots um, uh, disability community group. And um, we spoke quite a lot and they were interested in so many issues and were influencing policy within the party. So they were like a really effective caucus. Um, and so like so many of the policies um, were improved by that having that caucus. Um, so things like, um, it was just ridiculous. So there was like gonna be a new um, railway line planned and they had not included um, accessibility for all within the development of the and it's like this was only like two three years ago um so actually being able to kind of like effectively influence that was was amazing and i think that it shows um how much those two things are intertwined and interlinked so really um you know in terms of policy the kind of things that we need for climate change also you know we really need to look at them in a kind of systematic way like you've just pointed out yeah Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, Gwen, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, we really appreciate it. Jean, did you have anything else to say to Gwen? Uh, just to say it was a pleasure hearing from you today. I really enjoyed talking to you. So thank you very much for your time. Oh, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it so much. Thank you so much for inviting me on. And um, yeah, what a fantastic podcast. So I'm really excited to be part of it. So thank you so much. And let me know if you're ever in London. Did you like this video? If so, share with your friends and be sure to follow us on social media. And if you want even more resources, be sure to sign up for our email updates on our website, traipsingglobal.com. Keep learning new perspectives, keep being inclusive because it will make the world a better place for you and for everyone else. Thank you so much for watching and I'll catch you on another episode of the Trips and Global on Wheels podcast hour.